So I make this as a confession that I will meditate therein both day and night on a chapter in the morning and a chapter in the evening. And because I do that, my life is blessed. It's no more a mess. Now everything I touch, come on, everything I touch now turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Put your hands together for everybody that's welcoming, uh, that's online today, watching this by YouTube or Facebook. We are so glad you're with us. Give an ear to hear to what the Spirit of God is saying. We know that your life will be blessed. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word, O oh God, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask that you shine the light of your word to us today by the Holy Spirit. We give an ear to hear to what the Spirit of God would say to us through this message. God, you know exactly where we are and what we're going through. And you know what we need in order to be 10 times better than we've ever been. So speak to our hearts through this word and let not one person leave unchanged in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, I want to encourage you to open your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 1. We're starting a brand new series today, and I am excited about it. This series came to me by inspiration of the Lord. I thought I was going to go in a direction that I've been waiting to get to. And um, sure enough, he interrupted me and pointed me on the right path. And so um, this is coming by instruction from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now, in this new series, there's two verses of Scripture that we are going to be dealing with. There's Acts chapter 1, and then there's 2 Timothy chapter 3. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, it says this. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the scripture here says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So the new series that I'm announcing today for the next several weeks is called Got Power. Ask your neighbor, Got Power. (laughs) So obviously the, the, the effort, the intent, the goal for this series is for you and I to have this power in our lives when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. But as I said, there's two foundational scriptures, one in Acts chapter 1, and then the other is here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse number 1 and 2 say this, But now know this, in the last days perilous times will come. Now, this is something that we should know. Or in other words, God wants us to know this. This is something that we shouldn't be unfamiliar with. We should be knowledgeable about. And that's this, that in the last days, there's going to be very difficult, perilous, dangerous times that come. How many of you all know that we're living in the last days? I believe that. I mean, just this week we had this, you know, another catastrophe in in New Orleans where, did I say that right? New Orleans? I used to say New Orleans because I was from the north. And I was corrected because so many people who had faith family are from Louisiana, not Louisiana. Oh, I've been corrected. Yes, yes. You know, when you see certain tragedies and perilous things happen, it shouldn't be a surprise. You shouldn't think, oh, what is the world coming to? 
Jesus actually prophesied about the end of days and the last times. He said there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. There are going to be earthquakes in different kinds of places. There are going to be famines and pestilences and a lot of bad things that will happen. Paul following the same leading of the Holy Spirit, prophesied that in the last days, there are going to be perilous times that come. Now, I also understand this. You say, well, you know, I mean, are we living in the last days? Oh, undoubtedly we are. See, understand that a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. So even though this was written 2,000 years ago and they talked about the last days even beginning at that time, it's only been two days since they wrote this stuff <laughs> in God's perspective. So I want you to understand carefully what I'm about to read is happening right now. He lists it out for us. He says, know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves. Isn't that true today? I remember Terrell Owens, and this was probably 10 years ago, Terrell Owens said, I love me some me. Oh, come on. I guess y'all didn't. And we live in that kind of culture where I remember this guy had a really nice, you know, two door sports car and his license, his personalized license plate said King me. You know, like in chess you get or in checkers, you know, King me. But we live in a culture that's all about King me. It's all about me, myself and I. We live in a me first culture. And that is a sign of the time. He goes on beyond that. He said, not only will they be lovers of themselves, they'll be lovers of money. You know, there was a time in the United States where people shut down on Sunday uh, just so they can preserve uh, worship and time spent with family. But people will leave God and leave their family to earn extra money. Come on, during the weekend and the time. God said, six days a man ought to work and the seventh he ought to rest. You know, thank God for organizations that shut it down on a Sunday. But the reason why right now there's some people filling up the marketplaces and the, and, 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 the, and, 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 and working. You know, it always amazes me to see certain trades out. You know, it's one thing to have different kind of businesses open. But, you know, what is the landscaper doing on a Sunday morning? And the pool man, come on. Well, what it is is that they are lovers of money. Not only that, he lists that there will be boasters, there will be proud, there will be blasphemers, there will be those that are disobedient to parents. How about this one? Unthankful. And if you got a child, I know you're learning because I'm learning. If you teach a child, I mean, this boy two years old, I give him something and he doesn't say thank you, I'm taking it back. You're not going to grow up in this world and be like so many. There are grown folks you can do something for them, give something to them and they don't say thank you. You know why that is? Because of entitlement. You know, people are unthankful. They, they feel like what, they, what you get on the job, the job owes them. Come on. What you get in the office, they owe me. That The government, they owe me. Reparations. I don't even know if I said it right. But they become unthankful and unholy. Now, I don't know about you, even before we continue, I don't want to find myself in this list. But he continues in verse number three. He says they're unthankful. In verse three, he says they're unloving, unforgiving. Uh, Kara, can you help me, please? They're unthankful. They're unloving, unforgiving. They are slanderers. They're without self-control. Again, I don't want to be in that list where I'm without self-control. How about this one? Brutal. You hear about some bad things, some really dark things that happen, and it's because we're living in the last days. And not only are we just pointing out the physical brutality, but you can be emotionally brutal with how you treat people and even verbally brutal. But he goes on, he says that there will be those that are despisers of good, traitors. Uh-huh. Kevin Durant. <laughs> there, there was a day and time where you stayed with the team that you were a part of. But now, because men are lovers of money, if this team will pay me more than that team, then I'm going with this team. Oh, it's quiet. 
Kawhi Leonard. If you didn't know, he got traded from Toronto. How many of y'all know there's some people in Toronto who are thinking, traitor? <laughs> hey, man, I'm kind of hopefully celebrating Russell Westbrook, but Chris Paul, traitor? So they're traitors. And then how about this one? Headstrong. Have you ever met anybody that's headstrong? I'm telling you, I don't want to be in this list. Another thing that we'll see happening as closer we get to the return of Jesus, people will be haughty and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. The Bible says also that there will be men who will have, in verse 5, a form of godliness, but denying its power. And it says, from such people do what? Turn away. Now, I wanted to take my time to go through this because we're living in this right now. And just like I said that I don't want to be found anywhere on this list, the one that concerns me most is the one that's right here in verse 5. Because I can imagine for the folks that are in the world that they're lovers of pleasures and lovers of money and lovers of themselves and brutal and so forth, but I don't imagine Christians being in this list in this time of perilous times, but yet when you add that there will be folks that have the form of godliness, that's got to be talking about Christian folks. I don't look at people in the world and think, hey, they've got the form of godliness. I don't see how they treat each other and how they talk to one another and think, wow, they are acting just like God. No, I expect the world to be the world, to act the world, and to look the world. But he says in the last days, there are going to be folks that are just like you and I, church going folks. And simply, it says that all they do is that they have the form of godliness, but they deny its power. I want to talk to you today about an empty cup. There's a saying that you can't pour from an empty cup. As we talk about God power, obviously in this message and in this series, we want to examine ourselves from the word of God to make sure that we're not falling in this list, especially where it says that we can have a form of godliness but deny its power. So my question to you today is do you have the form of godliness. What does that mean? Is there anything about your life that's like God? Now, oftentimes when you think about the word godliness, um, immediately you think about the word holiness. So it could be that he's talking about a bunch of folks that have the form of holiness, but they don't have its power. But a better definition of the word godliness is not holiness. Yeah, God says, be ye holy even as I am holy. But if he was saying, have the form of holiness, then he could have just said, have the form of holiness. But what did he say? He said, there'll be folks that have the form of godliness. What does it mean to be godly or godliness? It simply means to be like God. So my question to you today, is there anything about you that's like God? Now, that's an easier question to examine. And I don't want you to answer this just how you feel. Because you may be here today and feel like, no, I've done some things and I'm not pleased of and I don't feel like I have godliness. But I want you to answer with me this question from the word of God. And what does the Bible say about those who have the form of godliness? Who is this group that he's talking about that have the form of godliness? Are you all ready for this? Amen. Well, let's go through the word of God. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, this is the very beginning. The Bible says in verse 26, <clears throat> then God said, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. 
Notice in verse 26, he says right off, and this is at the beginning. If you want to know what it looks like when God started the whole thing, he said in beginning Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, God said, let there be light, and there was light. He created the heavens and the earth. Amen? Well, on that sixth day, he made man. And when he went through that process, we have recorded a prophetic conversation. God said, let us. Now, at that point, there were no men that were yet made. So the question becomes, who was he talking to? God said, let us. Well, if you understand this, and I don't have time to teach it, but the Bible teaches that God is a tripart being or a triune, has a triune nature. That there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. What you have a picture is, uh, in this verse, is a picture of the Trinity. So God said to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, let us, come on somebody. So then he said, let us make man, watch this, in our, what? image the image is a form you, you could literally exchange the word he said let us make man in our form in, in 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 our picture and according to our likeness so again if you take that word godliness and you break it down it just simply means god likeness he said let us make man like us so if you want a picture of what God looks at, looks like, just look in the mirror. Come on. The Bible talks about that he'll lift up his countenance upon you and that he'll smile upon your life. Come on, somebody. That means, God, so, you, so you'll know God doesn't have an eye right in the middle of his forehead. He doesn't have a ring of eyes all the way around his head. Come on. He doesn't have many breasts as some have described as many breasted ones. Come on, somebody. No, if you want a picture, the Bible says that the hand of the Lord was upon him. So God's got hands. That the arm of the Lord is not too short. Come on. Is there anything too hard for God? It even talks about that at the blast of his nostrils. <laughs> if you want a picture of God, you could actually absolutely look in the mirror. We were made in his image and according to his likeness. Verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image and in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So you could take this one verse of scripture and say all of humanity is godlike and that they were made in the image and likeness of God. But if we right now go throughout all humanity, there are some folks that though they might have hands and a head and arms and legs like God, so forth and so on, they're not acting like God. They don't have anything that's like God, except for that physical body at, at the least. So what's going on here? Well, the Bible talks about one man that messed it up for every man after him. And that man was Adam. God made that man, put him in a garden, told him don't eat of that tree. He disobeyed God, which is a sin. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death passed or spread to all men because all have sinned. So not everybody on this planet is a child of God. Not everybody on this planet walks in the image of God. Why? Because Adam messed it up for all men. So every man born after Adam was born into sin and actually born with Satan's nature. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Have you ever heard that verse of scripture? Yeah, all of us had fallen short of God's image. The glory of God, you could say, is the very image of God. It's his form. Amen? And so what's going on here? Well, the Bible, Jesus, not just the Bible, but Jesus talked about to certain religious folks. He said in John 8 and 44 that you are of your father, the devil. 
And the desires of your father you want to do, he was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and what? The father of it. What I want to point out, though, is not only he the father of lies, he is the father of a family in the earth. The Bible teaches us that there are only two real families in the earth. We're not talking about the Brian family or the Amos family. Amen. You're not talking just about the Scott family. In reality, there are only two families in the earth. There's the family of God, and then there's the family of the devil. He was talking to certain people, and they thought that Abraham was their father, but Jesus telling them the truth. He said, you are of your father, the devil. The works that he does, you'll do. Why? Because you got his nature. And then when we look throughout the world today, we see people who steal, kill, and destroy, who commit murder, and do all of those bad things. Why? Not because they're like God. Oh, I'm preaching good today. But because they are like the devil. So when we ask ourselves that question, we've got to keep this in mind. Because not everybody on the planet. You know, some people have the idea that all roads lead to heaven. Not all roads lead to heaven. The actual road to heaven is narrow. Wide is the gate that goes to hell. And many there be that go that way. But narrow, straight is the gate. Come on. Jesus said it this way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he and the man that comes unto the Father must come by me. Am I preaching good this morning? Amen. So there are really only two. Matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14 and 15. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. There's God's family in heaven and there's God's family in the earth. And not everybody in the earth is a part of God's family. There's some people that are of the family of the devil. So here's this picture painted. Yes, we were made in the image of likeness of God, but then we became like the devil. So not everybody has the form of godliness. Some of them have the devilish, deviliness. I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> Ungodliness. But the Bible says when you and I were born again, something very powerful happens on the inside. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, the Bible says, therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, if any man be in Christ, anybody here be in Christ, if you have accepted Jesus Christ, if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, then this has happened. He is a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old previous and moral spiritual condition has passed away, and behold, the fresh and new has come. When you and I get born again, we're not renovated. It's not the old you and now the better version of you. It's a new you altogether. Where it says he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. It's not a renovation. It's a total demolishment of one and a, a creation of another. One translation says he becomes a new species of being that has never before existed. When you and I get born again, that means we become again like God. We exchange Satan's nature for God's nature. Something new happens on the inside of us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, he says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the what? Image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So notice when you and I are born again, he makes us to the form of, of the image of Jesus. Come on, y'all got to get this. So I can begin to answer this question. That if you are born again, you are made in the form of Jesus. If we could do an autopsy of you in the realm of the spirit, every part about you spiritually is just like God. Come on, somebody. 
you would then fall into that category of at least having the form of godliness. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, go there with me. Man, y'all working me hard today. <clears throat> this was so much easier at the 830 service. <laughs> Amen. But this is good because you're learning something. Yeah. Amen. In 2 Peter chapter 3, if we were to do an autopsy of you, you would look like Jesus in the realm of the spirit. And remember, just like God is three parts, there's God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Man also was made in the image of God with a tripart nature. We are a spirit being, we possess a soul, and we live inside of a physical body. Say that out loud. I'm a spirit being, I possess a soul, and I live in a body. Now that thing about being a soul man, I know you cool, but you're a spirit man. Y'all remember Sam and Dave? I'm a soul man. Dun, 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 dun. I'm a soul. Just because you got a little swag and you walk and you know you you don't just ride. You don't just come on. You you got soul, but you're not soul and body. It, it's in the world's got this idea that it's mind and body. No, it's so far beyond mind and body. It's spirit, soul, and body, and that's according to First Thessalonians five and twenty three. I pray, God, you preserve your whole spirit, soul, and body. So you're made. Matter of fact, you're made in the image of God as a spirit being. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him. How? Come on. In spirit and in what? In truth. Amen. Well, notice, though, when you got born again, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, something happened to you on the inside. The old you died and someone new who has never before existed became alive. You were born anew. Second Peter talks about this. In chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and what? Godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Couple things in this verse. Number one, God through his divine power, when you were born again, he gave you everything you needed to be just like him. He gave you the form of himself. God likeness. All of it was given to you through his divine power. Who called you? Somebody say out loud, I'm called of God. Amen. I just wanted to put that together from the last series. And then verse 4. So here's the pine power who's called us by glory and virtue by which he has, we have been given to us exceeding great precious promises that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So the next thing this verse teaches us is that we are partakers of God's nature. Am I going too fast? Why? Because the Bible says that not only were we given everything that we needed to be godlike, but also through the precious promises, we have been given God's DNA. So yeah, we would do an autopsy and find out God's got a heart, you got a heart, God's got a soul, you got, come on, God's got this, you got that. But not only that, if you test the blood, I mean, if you did my blood right now, you'd find out that I've got my father's and my father's father, so forth, I've got their blood in me. You know, I would do ancestry, but I already know. I know if I do, I, I, I gotta be somewhere from middle Africa. I gotta be. You can't be this dark and not be... Right from the middle of Africa. <laughs> but life is so far beyond your ancestry. Because the color of your skin don't matter. But who's your father does. And when you accept Jesus, he gives you his nature. And as a result of that nature, you're not the same as you used to be. Matter of fact, you know, the Bible teaches us when you get his nature, you, you're not the same. You know, you, don't, you can't even fit back in the world if, if you wanted to. 
you know, you know, I like to dance. And before I really committed my life to God, I used to dance. I'd be out there. You know, I can't even do it right now. If I went to the club, they would know that's a Christian right there. <laughs> Come on, I'd be there. Yeah, you know, I'd be in there. Yeah. And I even think I got the money. And I don't, I don't think I had the moves. Amen. Why? Because my nature has changed. Come on, some of you all know exactly what I'm saying. Even if you were to get mad at God, leave and try to go, you know, the worst person on the planet is not the sinner and, and, and certainly not the saint. It's the believer who's backslidden. Because they feel one way where God is concerned and they don't fit in where the world is concerned. That's a life of misery. And it's all because you've got his nature. I was preparing this message and something came to me. I wrote it down in my notes and, you know, I, I, I study and I take notes and, and under inspiration, you know, I, I want to bring it back out. But sometimes, you know, I'm, I'll get it in my notes and I won't get it out. But I was prompted to put this next note to, in a place where you can see it. And I don't know if it's for somebody that's on the Internet or somebody that's in this room. And you're evaluating this question. You're, you're, you're endeavoring to be serious about God and you're walking your relationship with God. But if you were to answer this question based on how you feel, you don't feel like you have the form of godliness. But I need you to understand, this was the note that came to me. And I believe this is God speaking to you. That just because you do bad things, it doesn't mean that you don't have God's form. Let me say that again. Just because you do bad things doesn't mean that you don't have God's form. The title of this message, part one, is called An Empty Cup. This is a cup. How do you know? It has the form of a cup. Come on, somebody. And this we can call emphatically a cup because it has all of the likenesses of what defines a cup to be a cup. You can put good things in a cup. And please understand, this is not liquor. This is not one of those kind of churches. <laughs> you know, I've been to some churches like long, long time ago, and I always wondered what the pastor had in the cup. <laughs> you ever wonder that? <laughs> now this is an empty cup. Inside of a cup, there can be good. And inside of the cup, there can be bad. There could be something life-giving on the inside of this cup. There could also be poison on the inside of this cup. And then also, the cup can be empty. My question to you is, do you have an empty cup? Now understand, where we are in this moment is asking ourselves, do we have the form of godliness? So please understand, just because there may be bad things inside of your cup doesn't change the fact that there's a cup. And just because you do bad things in your life doesn't change the fact that you are godlike in your nature in your form if we were to put god and you before us we would see so much that's alike okay now have you ever seen a christian do some bad things say some bad things live in a way that makes you question all christians Maybe you're here or even online looking and, and, and your attitude is, you know, 
I, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm giving church a chance, but there's so many hypocrites in the church. Matter of fact, there's somebody in the room right now, I ain't going to say her name, or that brother over there, I done seen him last week. Come on, there's people in my mind I'm thinking is, that's in the family or, or on the job. You might be in that place and you're thinking that if Christianity was based on how this person lived, then I don't want any part of that. What I'm explaining is how you can have the form of godliness, but something else be coming forth from your life. The word Christian is actually in the Bible. Not all things are in the Bible that we talk about, but the, excuse me, the word Christian is in the Bible. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, and when they had found him, he brought him into Antioch, talking about Paul. And so it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. This is a good place to know. How many of y'all know when, the, when you come to church, it's good to be taught? And I believe at a church like Faith Family, and I love good preaching, but if you don't know what you're shouting about, then you can be in trouble. It's good to see what the word of God has to say with your own eyes. So they were teaching a whole bunch of people, and the Bible says that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. You know what that word Christian means? It's what it's supposed to mean. Like we kind of, I'm a Texan. I am a Texan. I like the Texans. I like to rock his, um, okay, let me get off base. I'm a Texan now, okay? I'm also an American, right? I'm a human. I'm a Christian also. Now, we can categorically define that, and it can have some meaning, but in reality, what it means to be a Christian is to be Christ-like. Christian, it means I have the likeness of Christ. That means if you were to see him, you could see evidences of me. And there are examples in scriptures where when people encountered other people that had been with Jesus, they would recognize there's something different about you. I'm not just playing about trying to go back to the club. You really stand out. When you try to be firm with the guys and try to hang out with your friends that are ungodly and you try to fit in, it won't work. Why? Because you're not the person that you used to be. And they recognize that. In Acts chapter 4, it says in verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. So when you spend time in the word of God, it transforms you. You become the image of that word. And so it is in your and my life. When we spend time with Jesus, they will realize that we're looking like him. Matter of fact, you all remember the story, Peter. He, he said, I, I, there's no way I'm going to deny you. Jesus said, by the time the cock crows once, you're going to deny me three times. Sure enough, he found he was traveling, went far with Jesus. They were beating him, hitting him in the face, talking about prophesying, tell me who hit you. He's watching all of this, and he was warming himself by the fire. He's inside of the enemy's camp, and he's watching all of this happen. And the Bible says that there was a little girl, servant girl, standing there with him, and she recognized him and asked him, aren't you one of the guys that was with Jesus? And he was like, no, girl, I don't know what you're talking about. Matter of fact, he went over to another. You ever see somebody out in the public, maybe you with your family, and she like, hey, and you're like, girl, I don't know you. <laughs> you thinking, right? Come on, y'all got to help me now. <laughs> he went over to another bed on the fire, and he's warming himself on that fire, and another girl was like, you been with Jesus, ain't you? You see, them girls will get you in trouble. I talk to the people on the internet. You're like, girl, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All the men say, hey, amen. Man, watch it. Them girls will get you into trouble. <laughs> then a guy, he spoke up and he said, yeah, man, you had me. Matter of fact, in Luke 22, that's where I'm referring to, verse 56, a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, just looking at him, she looked intently at him and said, you know what? This man was also with him. Why? There's godliness. There's the form of godliness. Are you all seeing this today? Now I'm going somewhere with this. So you do have the form of godliness. Now the question that remains is are you denying the power? So now that I've just taken, and that's all I wanted to do. I'm getting ready to close. 
But I wanted to take today and to show you that you do have the form of godliness, but the real question is, are you denying the power? Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts 19 as I close. In Acts chapter 19, this story, I, I, I am so impressed. I'm so impressed by this, Sister Viney that I believe I'm supposed to minister this story every time I minister this message. Because I want you to find out if you've been living like the guys in this story. Because the guys in this story have the form of godliness, but they deny the power. What are you talking about, Pastor? In Acts 19 and verse 11, God was working miracles. Have you ever wondered where are the miracles of God today? Have you ever wondered when will it be that we will see the blind eyes open that it was in Jesus' ministry? When Have you ever wondered when will...